My name is Yvonne de Laplace, Investment Specialist at UBP for the Impact Platform, and today I'm with Ellie Cohen, who is co-managing the Positive Impact Emerging Equity Strategy. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Ivan. The main issue we want to address today is that an investor focusing on low carbon emissions could end up investing in polluter while excluding some of the most important providers of solution to the climate emergency. What a counterintuitive outcome. Well, in a nutshell, this results from the inadequacy of the data and methodologies generally used to measure companies' carbon emissions. Okay. Could, could you please tell us how we measure the carbon emission? The, the carbon emissions of a company and its products fall into three categories. The, the first one, known as Scope 1, consists of direct emissions from activities that a company controls, such as the uh, use of fuels inside, vehicle fleet, air conditioning, and so forth. The second one, Scope 2, consists of indirect emissions from energy purchased and used. And finally, the third one, Scope 3, measures all other indirect emissions coming from sources the company does not own or control, such as all the emissions produced uh, coming from the supply chain, as well as those arising from the use of the products. Interesting, Ali. And how difficult is it to measure these different scopes? Well, understandably, scope three emissions are notoriously hard to measure. Many companies, both upstream and downstream, and many factors contribute to these carbon emissions, including the country in which the operations take place, the production processes involved, proximity to raw materials, and many other factors. Furthermore, there is uh, no internationally agreed standard for measuring these emissions, and therefore it is very difficult to measure scope three emissions. And in this context, how do companies deal with the challenge of computing scope three emissions? Most companies choose to limit their uh, disclosures to scope one and two only. They, they do not report uh, scope three emissions. As a result, the, the providers of low carbon benchmarks, which are the basis of many low carbon ETFs, only use scope one and two emissions in their calculations. Okay, but is it a really issue to ignore scope three emissions? The big problem with uh, ignoring scope three emissions is that depending on the company, they could be multiples of scope one and two combined. For example, according to Morgan Stanley, the majority of an oil company's emissions come from the use of the hydrocarbon products it sells. Morgan Stanley estimates that for European oil majors, scope three emissions are eight times larger than scope one and two put together. And is the unavailability of scope three data the main reason to question the validity of low carbon portfolios? Unfortunately, there is even a bigger problem related to the methodology used by low carbon benchmark providers. These providers fail to consider the carbon emissions avoided through the use of a company's products. This is the reason why low carbon portfolios may end up excluding some of the most important providers of solutions to the emission problem. Okay. So, you know, I, I think, Elia, at this stage of the discussion, it would be really great if you could provide us an example. Well, take the example of uh, Shini Solar. This is a Chinese company that is among the world's leading solar glass manufacturers. It also owns and operates solar farms. Now, according to MSCI, its carbon emission intensity is more than 1,600 tons of carbon dioxide per million dollar of sales. Now, the comparable figure for Royal Dutch Shell is 218. So, for investors trying to reduce the carbon footprint of their portfolios based on this data alone, it makes perfect sense to buy Shell and sell Shiny. 
Except that, of course, carbon emissions produced by using shell products are estimated to be around eight times the figure considered by MSCI. Now, in the case of Shinyi, on the contrary, by using the solar farms they have and the products they have, they avoid nearly 2.1 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions annually. So that's more than 2,140 tons per million dollar of sales. Now, if you include those figures in the calculations, you realize that Shell's carbon intensity is actually not 218, but cl closer to 1,962. And Shinye's carbon intensity is actually negative. We, we estimate it to be ne negative 516. In other words, as common sense would suggest, Shell is a big source of emissions, while Shinye offers a solution. Okay, so if I do understand it well, what you tell us is that many companies whose products damage the environment have low carbon emissions according to the measures used by the industry, and that on the other side, solar and wind energy, for example, which are two of the most important ways of mitigation carbon emissions, are considering as emitting large amount of carbon. Exactly. And this is why if an investor chooses a low carbon fund with the intention of helping the environment, this portfolio is unlikely to be fit for purpose. This is probably less of an issue for institutional investors, which will look beyond just carbon data when selecting funds. But it is a bigger problem for retail investors who lack the resources to do this. Until better data collection, monitoring, and measurement methods emerge, the finance industry should not just rely on reported carbon data. It should develop more sophisticated and holistic methods to measure the environmental impact of portfolios. Thanks, Ellie. This topic is really fascinating. And thanks all for listening. If you want to continue this discussion, do not hesitate to follow us on Instagram or visit our website, ubp.com. Thank you.